and scientific research organization dedicated to showing proof of the existence of Yahweh, our Elohim, and the operation of his eternal purpose, pattern, and plan operating throughout eternity to this present day. This school was established as a result of a divine vision and revelation given to our founder, Dr. Henry Clifford Kinley, in the state of Ohio in the year 1931. The Lansing branch was established in the year 1973. The dean is Dr. Terry Walsh, and the president is Dr. Tina Pettigrew. In this school, we use the true correct and original name and title of the Father, the Word or Son, and the Holy Spirit, which are contained in the original Hebrew text. The true name of the Heavenly Father is Yahweh. His name has been improperly substituted with the title Lord. The true title of the word or son is Elohim. His title has been improperly substituted with the title God. The name of the Holy Spirit manifested in or out of a physical body is Yahshua. His name has been erroneously substituted with the name Jesus. Lord and God are titles and not names. The Apostle Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, tells us in 1 Corinthians 8 and 5 that there are Lord's many and God's many. But we now know each Lord must have a name and each God must have a name also. Elohim is a title, but unlike Lord and God, Elohim is a divine title. That means Elohim is the title that our Creator chose for Himself. Jesus is a name, but it is an erroneous name. A minor investigation on your part in a good dictionary or encyclopedia would prove that neither the Hebrew language, the Greek language, nor the Latin language have any characters or letters in their alphabet that would produce the sound that is made by this letter J. Neither was there a letter J in the English language until some 1,400 years after the Messiah's death. Therefore, such names as Jesus and Jehovah are impossible renderings for the true and original name of our Father and His Son. Christ is a title just like Lord and God. Yahweh is spirit, and in his pure spirit state, he is incomprehensible and inscrutable. He is the ultimate source, substance, limits, and bounds of everything. We have Yahweh in his pure spirit state symbolized on this chart as a cloud. Yahweh is not a cloud. He merely chose a cloud to symbolize himself because a cloud has no particular or descriptive shape and form. We have drawn this cloud all around the edges of this chart to show you that everything on the chart is within the cloud. In like manner, everything in the universe abides within the pure spirit state of Yahweh. Yahweh, knowing that man could not perceive of him in this pure spirit state, took on shape and took on form 
right within himself as Elohim. This is the word or son, a super incorporeal being that is having the shape and form of a man, but without flesh and blood. This form can only be seen in divine visions and understood in divine revelations. Later on, this self-same spirit manifested himself in a physical body and walked the earth plain as Yahshua the Messiah, whom the world calls Jesus Christ. Now there is only one name given unto salvation, and we must know that name. So the simple yet intelligent question that we should ask ourselves is, what was the name of the Savior during the time he walked the earth plain? A further understanding of this name and title may be had by reading the preface of the Holy Name Bible. Also at this school, we teach by the divine pattern of the universe. It is called the divine pattern because it is Yahweh's pattern. After Yahweh led the children of Israel out of Egypt, he called Moses atop Mount Sinai and showed him the tabernacle pattern in a vision. Yahweh instructed Moses to build one exactly like it in the wilderness of Sinai. The pattern consists of a most holy place, holy place, and a court round about. These three compartments make up the one tabernacle pattern. In this school, we show proof that everything in the universe is made and operates according to the structure and the function of this threefold tabernacle pattern and that absolutely nothing escapes the pattern. The primary constitutional objectives and aims of this class are as follows. First, to help you find and know Yahweh, our Elohim. He really is and actually exists. Second, to form a nucleus of universal brotherhood of humanity in Yahshua the Messiah, without distinction of race or nationality, creed, sex, caste, or color. Third, to investigate the unexplained spirit law or so-called law of nature, and the powers latent in man. Fourth, to encourage and promote the study of the scriptures, comparative religions, psychology, philosophy, and modern practical and occult science. Fifth, to extirpate current superstition, skepticism, and ignorance. Six to learn, know, and understand the operation of Yahweh's eternal purpose through the dispensations and ages. Seventh, to discern and avoid being deceived by Lucifer, the serpent, the devil, the dragon, or Satan and his demons, operating the mystery of iniquity on earth through the dispensations of time. Eighth, to earnestly contend for the common salvation and faith, which was once delivered unto the sons or children of Yahweh. Ninth, to make known that Yahweh from the beginning ordained, there is no other name given among men whereby man, whereby man must be saved, saving the name of Yahshua the Messiah. And tenth, to inherit eternal life now in the kingdom of Yahshua the Messiah with the hope of immortal glorification in the new earth state. Our watchword is peace. Our slogan is speak the truth. 
At this time, we will have a prayer by Dr. Mariah Lewis. Our scripture for today is 1 Samuel, the 16th chapter, to be read by Dr. Susan Craig. And I will be doing the announcements at the end of class. Good morning. Let us all bow our hearts and minds for a moment of prayer. And we just ask that um, Yahweh, through his son Yahshua, he'll continue to have grace towards us and mercy so that we can continue um, in him and to learn more about him. And we are thankful for all that he has given us thus far. And with that, I'll say hallelujah. I apologize, that should have been Mariah Coleman, not Lewis. <laughs> Sorry for that. Good morning. I'll be reading 1 Samuel, the 16th chapter from the Holy Name Bible containing the Holy Name version of the Old and New Testaments, critically compared with ancient authorities and various manuscripts revised by the late A.B. Trana, the Scripture Research Association. Chapter 16, 1 Samuel. And Yahweh said unto Samuel, How long wilt thou mourn for Saul, seeing I have rejected him from reigning over Israel? Fill thy horn with oil and go, and I will send thee to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have provided me a king among his sons. And Samuel said, How can I go? If Saul hear it, he will kill me. And Yahweh said, Take an heifer with thee, and say, I am come to sacrifice to Yahweh. And call Jesse to the sacrifice, and I will show thee what thou shalt do, and thou shalt anoint unto me him whom I name unto thee. And Samuel did that which Yahweh spake, and came to Bethlehem, and the elders of the town trembled at his coming and said, Comest thou peaceably? And he said, Peaceably, I am come to sacrifice unto Yahweh. Sanctify yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice. And he sanctified Jesse and his sons and called them to the sacrifice. And it came to pass when they were come that he looked on Eliab. And he said, Surely Yahweh's anointed is before him. But Yahweh said unto Samuel, Look not on his countenance, or on the height of his stature, because I have refused him. For Yahweh seeth not as a man seeth. For man looketh on the outward appearance, but Yahweh looketh on the heart. Then Jesse called Abinadab, and made him pass before Samuel. And he said, Neither hath Yahweh chosen this. Then Jesse made Shammah to pass by, and he said, Neither hath Yahweh chosen this. Again Jesse made seven of his sons to pass before Samuel. And Samuel said unto Jesse, Yahweh hath not chosen these. And Samuel said unto Jesse, Are here all thy children? And he said, There remaineth yet the youngest, and behold, he keepeth the sheep. And Samuel said unto Jesse, Send and fetch him, for we will not sit down till he come hither. And he sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy and withal of a beautiful countenance and goodly to look to. And Yahweh said, Arise, anoint him, for this is he. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brethren, and the Spirit of Yahweh came upon David from that day forward. So Samuel rose up and went to Ramah. But the Spirit of Yahweh departed from Saul, and an evil spirit from Yahweh troubled him. And Saul's servant said unto him, Behold now, an evil spirit from Elohim troubleth thee. Let our king now command thy servants, which are before thee, to seek out a man who is skillful player on a harp, and it shall come to pass when the evil spirit from Elohim is upon thee, that he shall play with his hand, and thou shalt be well. And Saul said unto his servants, Provide me now a man that can play well, and bring him to me. Then answered one of the servants, and said, Behold, I have seen a son of Jesse, the Bethlehemite, that is skillful in playing, and a mighty valiant man, and a man of war, and prudent in speech, and comely person, and Yahweh is with him. Wherefore, sent meant, wherefore Saul sent messengers unto Jesse and said, Send me David thy son, which is with the sheep. And Jesse took an ass laden with bread and a bottle of wine and a kid and sent them by David his son unto Saul. 
And David came to Saul and stood before him, and he loved him greatly, and he became his armor bearer. And Saul sent to Jesse, saying, Let David, I pray thee, stand before me, for he hath found favor in my sight. And it came to pass, when the evil spirit from Elohim was upon Saul, that David took an harp and played with his hand. So Saul was refreshed, and he was well, and the evil spirit departed from him. Good morning, class. I would like to remind everyone at this time to please quiet all cell phones and electronic devices so our class is not disturbed. I'd also like to take this moment to welcome our visiting brethren from the Southfield class, Dr. Marilyn Domitz and Dr. John Domitz, for joining with us. Thank you both for coming. It's an honor and a pleasure to have you here. Choir. Smooth operator. Smooth operator and surely fade away. Encourage my soul and let us journey on. Though the night is dark and I am far from home, everybody says, Thanks be to hell, the morning light appears. Oh, don't you know that the storm is passing over? The storm is passing over, the storm is passing over, hallelujah. Encourage my soul and let us journey on. Though the night is 
is dark, and I am far from home. Thanks be to hell, the morning light appears. Oh, don't you know that the storm is passing over? The storm is passing over. The storm is passing over. Hallelujah. 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 The storm is passing over. The storm is passing over. The storm is passing over. Hallelujah. Encourage my soul and let us journey on. Though the night is dark and I am far from home. Everybody says, Thanks be to hell, the morning light appears. Oh, don't you know that the storm is passing over. The storm is passing over. The storm is passing over. Hallelujah. 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 The storm is passing over. The storm is passing over. The storm is passing over. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. The storm is passing over. The storm is passing over. The storm is passing over. Hallelujah. Somebody tell me, what would you do if Yahshua hadn't chosen you? You 
better tell me what would you do if Joshua hadn't chosen you? Somebody tell me what would you do if Joshua hadn't chosen you? Now if it had not been for Joshua, now I would surely fade away. chosen you you got to know where you should be if Joshua hadn't chosen you now if it had not been for Joshua now I would surely fade away if it had not been for Joshua oh you wouldn't have no peace of mind you wouldn't know this pattern one way or the other way you wouldn't know about the ages and dispensations Oh, you just might surely, surely fade up away. Thank you, choir. Our first speaker for this morning will be our visiting brethren from the Southfield class, Dr. John Domans. Good morning, everyone. Good morning to those, uh, I say, near and afar, because we're also meeting with our brethren who can see us through the miracle <laughs> of YouTube. And um, welcome to all. Uh, I'm happy to be here. Um, I do have something on my mind uh, that was stimulated from a lecture here last week. And um, I'll, sometimes my lectures take two or three lectures to get fully unpacked. Uh, but uh, one of our previous speakers um, in this class, Dr. Graciela Underwood, yes, Dr. Graciela Underwood, um, was going through on a Wednesday night class the blood, the water, and the spirit in these charts. And I was viewing at that time, and uh, what particularly caught my attention was the blood, water, and the spirit in this plate, where the spirit in this plate is represented by Michael the angel uh, with the flaming sword, and he's casting out Adam out of the garden. If you look real close, he's... <laughs> I do love these charts. Uh, you'll never get tired of these charts, and the closer you get to them, the better they get, actually. And Adam's there like this. Uh, I, I have definitely, I'm paraphrasing now. This is not in the Bible. I have definitely screwed up. <laughs> Something to that effect in modern language. See his hands covering his face. Now, previously in the garden, he didn't feel that way. And we read in the textbook that Yahweh created Adam and Eve innocent and holy and conscious and soul, and they were at a state of perfect peace in this garden before Satan entered and deceived Eve with a lie. 
and uh, caused uh, Adam to partake of the tree of knowledge of good and evil and then the casting out. <coughs> and by the way, I, I didn't get the, I pointed this out in the Detroit class and it got a little startling. I said, the blood on here is the blood on the head of the serpent. You know, where'd you get that from? It's on the chart, <laughs> right? I didn't get it from nowhere, it's right on the chart. In other words, he said, because thou hast done this in dust of the earth and on your belly shall you go the days of your life. Um, and the sweat of his face was the water and there's the spirit. So what that caused me, there, there's a principles going on in these plates. And before I get to the principle of Adam falling, I'd like to go back to the tabernacle pattern, just set up a brief foundation uh, of this tabernacle pattern. Um, this tabernacle pattern is depicted uh, in fine detail in Exodus of everybody's Bible. It's always been there. There's never any time it hasn't been there. And we didn't know what that meant. And for the most part, I would say, in our religious experience, we just skipped over it. It's old stuff. It's what they did. And I don't particularly know what that is, so, so be it. But uh, this teaching is your Bible in pictorial form. And it's based on a vision in Revelation, which was given, I want to see, by Yahweh to Dr. Kinley. That's the proper way to put it. Some say it's Dr. Kinley's vision. It's a vision given to him by Yahweh. And he faithfully, and over a period of, I don't know, 46 years, well, first of all, I had these charts drawn up. See, this is the proof he saw something. <laughs> you know, now not only don't take my word for it, make me prove it, this is proof. <clears throat> and this is extensive. Th this will take, this will fill up your time. <laughs> And what was revealed in this was this tabernacle pattern in the book of Exodus, which is a threefold pattern, once again and in repeat, threefold pattern consisting of a most holy place and a holy place in a court roundabout. And these three compartments are one tabernacle pattern. Mm -hmm. And early in our learning um, to take some natural things to help us understand the spiritual things, we are ourselves, uh, as we have here, the man by the pattern. We're, we have three main compartments for our vessels. See, there's vessels in here which the priests use for their services on behalf of the people. And we have in our most holy place is our head, head with our brain and our eyes and such. Our thoracic, that's a big word, <laughs> thoracic. Uh, your lungs, your heart, um, performing the respiration and the distribution of oxygen through the heart with oxygen through to all of our parts of our body. Every cell has to get oxygen to survive. And then our court roundabout is our abdominal. And in here we show the kidneys, the adrenal glands, and the bladder, which is similar to this laver right here. Our waters of our body are emptied through here. And our intestines, which are served to digest our food, um, just like this burned the sacrifice of an animal's body. When we go home after class today, we're going to eat a sacrifice, <laughs> right? And it's going to be digested within our intestines and then go through our colon. And just as they dispose of the ashes and flesh and various things from there, we have a way of disposal ourselves. So we are made into likeness an image of Yahweh 
by the pattern of the tabernacle. Now, um, now that's just review, right? But there was a service in here wherein uh, we had t a high priest which had special duties once a year to go into this most holy place for the sin of the people. And two low priests which were involved in receiving the sacrifices, slaying them, preparing them for the altar, or washing them first, preparing them on the altar, and then putting them on the altar and burning them. We do have this cup of holy anointing oil, which was not used in the daily service. This was used for the anointing of the priests at the door um, to anoint them. And uh, I won't get ahead of myself, but this is in type of shadow of the anointing, or when John saw the Holy Spirit descend upon Yahshua at the baptism. He knew that that was the one. And they would go in here and perform services for prayer and the lighting of the candles in the morning, the candlestick, the table of showbread. And they would also eat in here. And we don't show those vessels. But this is where they ate their daily food. So, to kind of set the foundation, let's go to Hebrews, the ninth chapter, and refresh our memory. And then there's some key points. Um, a point to be made. Now Paul goes over this and he's it's the book of the Hebrews, he's writing it to them. In the ninth chapter. Okay. Yeah. Nine and one. <laughs> Hebrews nine and one. Mm -hmm. Then verily the first covenant had also ordinances of divine service and a worldly sanctuary. Now I'd like you to stop there. This first covenant specifically is the law of carnal ordinances. And we're reading from Hebrews, the ninth chapter, but we're only at the first verse right now. And this covenant, it had, what did it have? It had a sanctuary. Let's read, I don't know, repeat it right, the words they use. The first covenant had also ordinances of divine service and a worldly sanctuary. Now this, Paul is telling them this is a worldly sanctuary. Now, in the time that this was given, this was to be done. See, we're looking at this from this age, which is a present kingdom age. We're looking back, but at one time, this was real to them. In other words, they really had to do it. This was not optional to do it whether they felt like it or not. This, and this was given to them and this is called, the, actually, this is called the sanctuary, where you had this compartment, this compartment. And, but Paul's pointing out to the Jews now, while you used to do this, it's really a worldly sanctuary. In other words, it's not a spiritual sanctuary. Correct. And the point that we're making on this chart is in this new age that we live, that's us. We're, we're the sanctuary where the Spirit of Yahweh is supposed to dwell. And those Jews don't know it yet. Paul's preaching to them. They have not made the change. Even though the change has been made, Yahshua has died, he has buried, he has resurrected and poured out his Holy Spirit, there were those who didn't know this. And they were so steeped in this that they couldn't get out of it. And we run into that now with friends and brethren who are steeped in man-made religion and they can't get out of it. They're, they're there now. And this gospel is freely preached to them to show them a better way, a, 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 a living way. So this is a worldly sanctuary, this first covenant, which was given from Mount Sinai with its laws and its ordinances which governed every aspect of their daily life. I mean everything. And he said you will be a peculiar people. And when you try to follow this by George 
by golly and by gee, you are a per per peculiar. And I, like I said, I lived amongst them in Oak Park, Michigan. And they're walking down the middle of the street with their baby buggies in the middle of the winter, going to the synagogue on the Sabbath. And when it's done, they walk down the middle of the street. It's freezing out, and they're walking down. Why? Can't drive a car. Wear black clothes, black hats, black trench coat, black pants, black shoes, and a white shirt. And I'm just joking. Imagine their clothing store. It's got all black pants, <laughs> all white shirts, and all black shoes, and those are your choices. Right. Now, to be fair, every once in a long while, a man would come by in a brown suit or a blue suit, and I almost want to get out of my car and give him a hand. <laughs> Yay! Oh, you broke the mold. But, <laughs> but you notice these things because they're still trying to do it now. So it, it was an example to me. All right, so this was a worldly sanctuary. Read. Two, for there was a tabernacle made, the first wherein was the candlestick and the table and the shoe bread, which is called the sanctuary. This is called the sanctuary, and he calls this the first tabernacle. Didn't he? Um, well, he says the first. The there first. was a tabernacle made, the first, wherein was the candlestick and the table, the shoe bread, okay. which was called the sanctuary. All right. And after the second veil, the tabernacle, which was called the holiest of all. Now, we've got most holy place, but it can also be called the holy of holies or most holy of all. And there, there is a division here, or a veil, that divides this compartment and its activity or service from this one. And this one was only entered once a year, and he's going to describe that now. Read. Which had the golden censer and the Ark of the Covenant overlaid round about with gold, wherein was the golden pot that had manna, and Aaron's rod that budded, and the tables of the covenant. Now we have the tables of the covenant shown right here, and that's where Moses was told to put them. Um, now, I've got to go back just for a second. These are the second tables of stone. The first one was broken, which we have depicted Moses right here, breaking them at the bottom of the mount when he saw the sin of the children of Israel worshiping, of all things, a golden calf, which they had just previously, a 40 days or so before, told not to do that. And he grew angry, and he broke them, signifying that this first covenant that you're reading, that law would be broken. That's what that, in a type and a shadow, signified. And then Moses was told to take his own table of stone. You bring them up, and that signified the man's heart that Moses would take up on that trip, that last trip, and Yahweh would write again the law on them. And then, on that, after that trip, see on this first trip down, that this tabernacle or this compartment and this Ark of the Covenant wasn't even made yet. So there is actually no place to put it. So, you know, if, if you go over this enough, you realize Yahweh's very intelligent. He's, or if put it in the vernacular, he's pretty smart. <laughs> and he already knows which way things are going. To us, things look like they're skewed or out of order. But this is signifying that this second table of stone is going to be put in the now, the Ark of the Covenant, which they now then had completed, which signifies in this new age, the spiritual age, that this law would be written, the spirit law would be written into the man's heart or mind, which is prophesied by the prophet Jeremiah and others. A new heart will I give you. I'll write this law in your heart and in your mind. See? So these are prefiguring what's going to happen and what we've learned is that the law and the prophets or the bible well the world calls this the old testament these aren't stories they're prefiguring 
that Yahshua the Messiah, as he said, I, come, I don't come to destroy the Law and Prophets. I've come to fulfill or bring them into actuality. Mm -hmm. And they're pointing to a death, burial, resurrection. They're pointing to a new law that man can now, if he receives in his heart and mind, that can be kept. See? Now keep reading. He, he's going over it here. Hebrews 9 and 5. Mm -hmm. And over it the cherubims of glory shadowing the mercy seat, of which we cannot now speak particularly. Now when these things were thus ordained, the priest went always into the first tabernacle, accomplishing the service of Yahweh. There's the first tabernacle. <laughs> I'm telling you, he went always, and every day they had to come in here for prayer um, and for the prayer they would put incense on the altar. I believe that was three times a day, 9, 12, and 3. Um, and they, of course, they had sacrifices twice a day, and they had, they had so every day this compartment was used. All, and that's what he means, always. But what? But into the second went the high priest alone once every year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the errors of the people. Now he offered it for himself and for the errors of the people. And the errors of the people. Now I want to kind of stop there. I do want to get to the 15th verse, but what the testimony and the lecture given by um, Sister Graciela Underwood brought to my mind. See, this is going by the tabernacle too, you know. That's why it's one, two, three. Mm -hmm. In this particular one, it depicts a transgression, which is a downward or coming out of a state of innocence and holiness before Yahweh, which in this state and condition, they have no guilt. And what we learn by reading Genesis, the second and third chapter, is that when this transgression occurred, they went and hid themselves amongst the trees, for they knew they were naked. Well, okay, fine. They weren't doing that up here. They, they, weren't, they weren't guilty. They weren't nervous, afraid that they're in trouble now. Because this state and mind and condition is holy and innocent in the garden before sin entered into the world, now something has changed to where they are aware, and what we've learned now, they're aware of the flesh. Their eyes have been opened to carnality. Their eyes have been opened and exposed. Um, so we've got up here the age of conscience. See, here's the garden and the events that happen that were depicted on that chart. This conscience <clears throat> is a condemned conscience before Yahweh. It's not the same one as when they were in the garden. So a change has occurred, and in Adam is, um, see, the commandment was, you shall not eat of the tree nor touch it, for in the day ye do, ye shall surely die. Now Adam, in the day, in the day, so when he's coming out, the sun's going down now. It's going into darkness, showing man's mind is going into darkness, and in the day, now Adam lives to be 930. Now that's a long time for a man to live. And I'm not doubting it either. Um, but he died the day he did that. N not, not when he died, 930 years later he died. He died in the day where? In his heart and in his mind, and as Dr. Welsh is saying, he died instantaneously. In other words, not 930 years later. Boom. Now, I, I want to, I'm going to interject this point now. See, when she was giving that lecture, it was talking about Michael, the angel, whoosh, you got to go now. And the question came to my mind, why don't you want to let him back in? 
And that's the opposite direction, right? Mm -hmm. He is, now we know why he's being cast out, because he sinned. See, this is a place of holiness, of innocence. It represents the throne of Yahweh. And this mind isn't being allowed back in there anymore until a whole lot of things got to transpire to where Yahweh restores that. And we are the recipients of that restoration. And the world has not seen it. I think I say this every single time I get up here. There has been a change from this age to this age, and the world has not seen it. And the reason for it is, it's spiritual. It's not physical in the first place to look at. Now, they can look at us, and they surely do, believe it or not. But they can't see this spirit dwelling in our heart and mind unless the dictates of that are manifest through us. And our manifestations do tell what's in us. <laughs> this gives the dictates. And then this manifests it. See, you can give my wife a kiss. Or I go, <laughs> which I don't do. But either way, it's manifest, isn't it? What's in the mind? I just try to throw that in for extra little measure. All right, read. Eight. Mm -hmm. And the Holy Spirit, this signifying that the way into, holy, into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest, while as the first tabernacle was yet standing. Now hold it. Now that's important. See, only the high priest knew the way into this compartment. And he was the only one allowed in that mm -hmm. compartment. And he dared not come without blood. Mm -hmm. Dared not or they'd be dragging him out. That happened once before with Nadab and Abihu messing around early on. And they had the strange fire. They didn't know what they were doing. And sorry, that's rough. That's rough. It would point out to me that Yahweh is not messing around. You know, he sets, he, he tells man what he's doing, and he's not messing around. At any rate, the way in here is not made manifest. In fact, the way to get in here, there's no, there's actually no door there. You have to go around the side, slip through the curtain, come around, make this figure eight, and come out. So the, you couldn't see it by looking at it. The way in there is not made manifest. And this high priest, Paul says, we have a high priest. Our high priest, this was signifying Yahshua the Messiah, who did go into before Yahweh. See, this signifies the presence of Yahweh. That Yahshua went in for us, not without blood. And you're going to read that. So there's a, this is a setup if we're shown... And someone has to teach us. I mean, I, you won't read this out of the Bible with your brain. You can be a good reader, but you still can't get the meaning of it till this vision is opened up. And by the way, I mean, that is the value of this vision. And I, I say it, this is the correct interpretation of the Bible. Everyone else is reading and giving a man-made dictate of what they think it means and they don't have the essence of it correct. What they don't have is the spirit of it correct because they're not teaching by a vision or by the Holy Spirit. Any, you know what, anybody can buy a Bible and read it and give their opinion of what it, what it says. And in fact, I don't know how many religions there are, but there's something like over 32,000. 32, now listen, brothers and sisters, all of them can't be right. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, but people, I say, people pick religions like they choose cigarettes or, or food by flavor, right? Whatever suits them. And it's always physical. So the way into this, it's not made manifest. 
This is signifying Yahshua that went up there for us. But go ahead and read. Nine, which was a figure for the time then present in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices that could not make him that did the surface perfect as pertaining to the conscience. Now hold it. I'm sorry, but mm -hmm. that's got to be. See, these were types and shadows. They were examples for the time then present. Now, these are types and shadows. I shouldn't say this, but I, they were real for them. In other words, this really had to be done for their atonement, really. No joke. To us, they're types and shadows. So I, I say, these are real types and shadows. Does that make any sense? Real types and shadows. Real to them, type and shadow to us now because we have been freed from them by a better and more perfect sacrifice. Read. 10. Which stood only in meats and drinks and diverse washings and carnal ordinances imposed on them until the time of Reformation. Now that's the Reformation that we're talking about. <clears throat> and see, we've got it here. This is the law of carnal ordinances, and it was a law to them. <clears throat> it wasn't optional, and it was given to the Jews or the Israelites. It was not given to the Gentiles. And that's a common mistake that religion makes, that they read anything in the Bible and say, oh, he's talking to me. When he's ta speaking down from the mount, he was speaking to the Israelite nation. He was not giving those commandments to the Jews. So he fulfilled it to them first, and then to the Gentiles seven years later. His covenant was made with the, with the Jews. But he said, me too. So what we do is we... We dib and dab back here trying to pick out stuff that we'll do because we think it's talking about us, but we tend to do the ones that's the easiest to do that we like to do and not the rest. But they had to keep the whole law. And James gets into that. You, you have to keep the whole law. And what you couldn't keep, there was atonement or sacrifice for. This is an atonement for sin under the law. And now, this been, Dr. Welsh has made quite a point of it. There's sin under the law. There's sin from the first man, Adam. <clears throat> and I like to point out, sin is still in the world through a satanic spirit. He's the sinner in this age. Yahshua's forgiven all the rest. The sin that's going on is directly attributable to him. Either out of the body or in the body. And this spirit as has been, we'll get to it, has to be cast out. Now Adam, we'll go back here. See, in the previous two classes here, Adam is used, and Eve both are used as a type and shadow to teach us spiritual things. See, for example, Adam was cast out of the garden, which represents Satan being cast out of heaven. And he didn't cast Eve out. She went with him. So Satan was cast out, and the angelic, his angels, were cast out with him. So Adam and Eve being cast out represents that in a type and in a shadow. But we have to understand, Adam wasn't the devil. Adam's Adam, but he's being used in a type and a shadow. This is something that you physically can see to understand things that you can't see. And that's the wonderful gift of this vision and revelation that this pattern gives us stuff we can see. See, it's right up on the chart. We, of course, we have to be taught what it meant, what it means, but we can see this because you'll never see Satan cast out. He'll never come up and introduce himself. Hi, I'm Satan. I'm here to make your life miserable. Glad, glad to meet you. Listen to me and you'll go to the lake. He won't do that. <clears throat> and honestly, you can't see the Holy Spirit either. They're both manifest through the man, though. And that's, that's what's going on in this age. 
And this gospel is being preached so we can have well, Yahshua, our Passover is sacrificed for us. He's our Passover, or he's our salvation from this spirit, and then ultimately from the wrath of Yahweh. See, the wrath of Yahweh is going to be declared on him. He's getting it. But he has a host. And what he's like a virus that we'd like to be rid of. Mm -hmm. I've likened the COVID-19 to him. A little bit. And, and, and by the way, I'll throw this as a natural. And we were mentioned, talking about this yesterday. This COVID-19 virus is a virus. It's a SARS virus that has had other previous manifestations. But what they've learned in this round of COVID-19 is the concept of disease being transmitted by aerosols. That was not clearly understood by anybody. Hence the wearing of the mask, don't let the spittle come out, and be six feet in distance so that that spittle will drop to the ground and you won't get the infection. That's been known for a long time. What not been known is that it can, it's the prince of the power of the air. Aerosols don't drop anywhere. They float in the air. And you don't have to be six feet away to receive it. Because it's, and you, do you see it? No. No, you don't. That's the new thing that they have not, see, I'll tell you, nobody knew about this is how it works. See, they, there's a lot of big political, uh, my side's right, my side's right, your side's wrong, you're full of it, you're full of it, you're full of it, you're full of it. Nobody knew what this was. Nobody knew what to do. No, nobody knew, in other words, this, they knew about the plague, they, they knew about the flu in 1918, they didn't know about this. And now, I'm able to take the natural to understand the spiritual. You, you don't see this boy. He's just floating around looking to who he can devour. And he's got a narrative or, me a, narrative or a message for everybody. And it's always right here. He is not programmed to tell the truth. He's just not. He's like a negative wire. He, he flows one way. <clears throat> so what we're looking to do, what this vision is, whether anybody wants to believe it or not, it preaches Yahshua the Messiah and his Holy Spirit, which is the spirit of truth. And we're not saying we're better than other people. And that's, the, that's how they take it immediately. They take it like personal. Who do you think you are? How, how come you think you're right? Can't I be right too? You don't know the truth. They just... Just that, that's instantaneous, Dr. Welsh. They just snap into that. We have partaken in this. Now we know something about good and evil, and I have to testify to myself, I only knew about evil. I didn't know nothing, I didn't know nothing about good in its true essence. Now you, you speak for yourself how much you knew before you came to class about Righteousness. That's what I'm doing. Good. Yahweh Elohim, He is righteous. They, they said in this, they, I think Dr. Harris said, the standard of righteousness. You want to compare yourself to somebody, compare yourself to Him, or we now know, compare yourself to Yahshua if you want to. Mm -hmm. Now, we don't say we're righteousness, it's His righteousness in us that is cleansing the man to change his conscience. And I want you to read that verse again, because this high priest, this high priest, he's got sins. And you know what? He can't even go in there. The first sacrifice is made for who? Him. Him and his family. He has to be cleansed of sin before he can do the service up here. That's the first sacrifice. And that's, that's making a point, that the way in here is not known truthfully into the, see, what we want to get cleansed is our conscience. That's what we want in the end of the day. 
And we want that in us consciously. Now read that again. Nine. Yes. Hebrews 9 and 9. Which was a figure for the time then present, in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices that could not make him that did the service perfect. Couldn't make at, him perfect. As pertaining to the conscience. As pertaining to his conscience. It was a type and shadow of that. But the perfection to the conscience is in this age. And you talk about being made perfect in the Messiah, that's the healing of our conscience. And our oneness with him, that's him changing our heart and mind so that it can be conformed into his image or his will or his way. Now that's a process. That's, that's, that's a process, right? But it couldn't make him perfect so in types and shadows, he had to offer up a bullock and take that blood up here with this sensor and perform, uh, sp sprinkle the blood eastward seven times. And then he would do the next sacrifice for the people. And finally, he did a third sacrifice in sprinkling the blood for the sanctuary because their sin was upon it. This is where they came to confess their sin. And so he did all three of them. Now Paul's going to say about this blood. Go ahead and read. 11. Mm -hmm. But the Messiah, be, being come in high priest of good things to come, by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building. It's his body, the more perfect tabernacle. Why? The spirit of the living Elohim was in him. A more perfect one. Read. Neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. Now that is the message of the gospel of the kingdom, is Yahshua making himself a sacrifice, <clears throat> making himself a sacrifice. Now he's not going to use the blood of... Um, these sacrifices. It's going to be by his own blood. Now in order to do that, he needs a body. This isn't Yahweh Elohim in super corporal form. This isn't Yahweh in pure spirit. This is Yahweh's body. See, you can do it this way. We've learned about spirit, soul, and body, and that's in the textbook. Well, in pure spirit state, that, that's Yahweh. The soul of Yahweh is the superincorporeal form or the conscious part that we communicates with us. And the court roundabout, that's Yahshua's body, which is the founder called it, which I've never thought of it. Yahshua's body was the container of blood. Mm -hmm. He carried the blood in his body. And that blood is going to be used for a more perfect sacrifice now, this is what I respect about Yahweh. He is the one that created the man and the man to know him. He wanted that. But he's also the one who cast the devil out into Saturn, the earth, <laughs> not Jupiter. He casts him out into the earth. He says, a body hast thou prepared for me. He came down in his own body and he made the sacrifice of himself. He took it off and out of these carnal sacrifices and he took it upon himself to make atonement for man. They say this Jesus was God's little boy. Well, that's what they say. This is Yahweh Elohim in the flesh, sacrificing his own blood to make an end. Now, everybody can say Jesus died on the cross because you can buy a Bible and read it, can't you? But they don't know that he did this to make an end of this old way of worshiping 
which for goodness sakes wasn't given to us in the first place. There's, one, there's only one natural Jew in this room. And she didn't keep the law either. <laughs> no interest in it. Am I, am I telling the truth? Oh, yeah. No interest in keeping it. So that concludes, like Paul in Romans, the second and third chapter, it concludes them all under sin. The Jews sin with the law. The Gentiles sin without the law. And there's no, not one of them is a good. They've all sinned. So Yahshua's dying for all of them. And he's catching all of them. So these, this way, now we keep saying, you know, this wasn't to the Gentiles and blah, blah, blah. But see, what the Gentiles do, they say, yes, yes, Jesus died. They might even read that he fulfilled, but they will pick things and take them over from here to here on this side of the cross and say, you must do it to be saved. We've got a, <clears throat> I mean, there's so many things. There's, there's, no, there's no lack of examples. This baptism, we, we have a pamphlet that says, can water wash away sin? Now, here's the point. When they went to John to get baptized, they admitted they were sinners, and he, he was, see, I, I used to think John was a Baptist. I was naive. John wasn't a Baptist, he was a Jew. There were no Baptists back there. But that's how, you know, that's how I grabbed onto it. He's John the Immerser, and he's burying them. If, if you admit that you sin, this is a baptism of repentance. If you admit that you sinned, what do you do with the dead person? You, you, the, you bury them. This is the law of sin and death. Either you died or sacrifice died. And by the way, under this law, there were some things you couldn't use a sacrifice for. You just got your butt stoned. Because he said if, you, if a man sinned and he, unknowingly, then there's a sacrifice. There's some sins under there that you, you don't get to take a bull. You're dead. And everybody pick up a stone and chunk, 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 till there's a pile there. So this is the law of sin and death. But look at, and I never thought of this once. Uh, you, you, if this baptism could take away sin, this water, what's he doing this for? They'd already be free of sin. Yeah, yeah should we go, hey, good, I don't have to do it. They're, they're free of sin. I'll just live out my life till I'm old. Uh-uh. This, this didn't take any way buddies away sin then. And now they've got versions of it. I'm not Roman Catholic. Are there any Roman Catholics here that can attest to the baptism at, what, what do they do it when you're real young, like eight days or something? Ten days. Ten days. They sprinkle a little water, and that's to wash away these sins original sin in case the baby dies right. and then then he has to go to limbo, to go to limbo. <laughs> let's go look up limbo in the bible could we please isn't limbo where you go underneath the stick <laughs> that's limbo right how low can you go well that little water that's what the founder's talking about can that water wash away sin no all right this original wasn't to wash away sin either. Where, where are people getting that from? So it's his death that washes away the sin or makes an end to sin under this law. And then um, Hebrews 8 and 10 and Jeremiah uh, 31, 31 through 34, he'll write their law. Now this law is going to be written into the heart and the mind of man. And now this will clean the man according to the conscience. And that's really what we want from our time here, mm -hmm. is a clear conscience before our Creator and not guilt or fear of going to the lake. I'm telling you. Uh, all right, finish that up, Tim. I've got five minutes, and that's fine. 13. Done. Yes. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of an heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifieth to the purifying of the flesh. How much more shall the blood of Messiah, 
who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to Yahweh, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living Elohim. Purge your conscience from dead works. Now, he was having trouble with them keeping these dead works. And we have to be purged from that. I'm in a process of purging my body of a bacteria. It's called a cleanse. It's going to take some time. Now, I'm not infectious or nothing, but I... <laughs> no, I'm not infected, but I have to get... So you have to be purged of it. And, and what, it, our, what it does... See, th this, is, this law doesn't do nothing but remind you you're guilty because you know you can't keep it. There's always a feeling of, you know, there's something I didn't do right. That's to take that away. So we receive the, the Holy Spirit through faith. In order to do that, we must be taught. There's no way around it. That puts us into the body of Yahshua, the Messiah, so if you use the pattern, Yahweh Elohim, the body of Yahshua Messiah now consists of us. And he is the head of our body. We being many, see Yahshua is only in one body. You could say, see, there's the body of Yahshua. I see his body, I see his body, and nobody else is Yahshua. Now I'm not saying we're the sum total of him, but we are, we are grafted into his body. And we're Gentiles, most of us, so there's that grafting. We make up his body. He's the one head of the whole body. Just like you have one brain, which gives commandments to all of your body. Keep reading to 15 and I'm done. 15. Mm -hmm. 15. And for this cause, he is the mediator of the New Testament. That by means of death, for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the First Testament, mm -hmm. they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. See, receive the promise of eternal eternal inheritance. Now, I'm going to finish up here. I'll get into the Davidic covenant some other time, because that's after the law given to Moses. See, after Yahshua's death, burial, and resurrection, he ascends. Ten days later, he pours out his spirit, that's right here, into the hearts and minds of those in the upper room. And they receive the Holy Spirit, which is the fulfillment of the promise that he'd give them a new heart. See, and a new spirit what I, will I give you. And those dry bones become, if I can say it, wet bones. In other words, out of their bellies shall flow rivers of living water. That's wet. See, and Peter goes out and preaches to him, and 3,000 receive and believe. So he's being fruitful, he's multiplying. That's that Holy Spirit cleansing the heart and mind of the man. And what that does, if you see on this chart, this is an up chart, it makes the assembly of Yahweh Elohim, we being many make up his body, and it puts the man in heaven. And from this time, th from this time on, See, the founder says heaven is not a place. It's a state of mind. And we must, as I always say, me too, we must go to heaven before we go to the cemetery. The founder preached that. I'm, I, I'm not the first one to say that. And people are floating up somewhere and they'll get to heaven. But that state of mind, see, this tabernacle pattern, this is a type of heaven up in the most holy place. And by the purification of that, see, in other words, Adam can't go back in there because with that old mind, you can't. You can't go up here with sin. The high priest had to be cleansed before. Now we can go there without sin. We can, and we can appear in his presence without sin by the Messiah. That is the gospel of Yahshua the Messiah. It's spiritual. One more verse. And it's spiritual, it's not seen, but it is manifest. Read. 16. For where a testament is, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. Okay, that's, that's enough. So that's Yahshua. He is the testator through the prophets and the patriarchs. He's the testator of the First Testament. So he comes in, and, and a lot of people have made this example, like when you sign a contract, you, or you finish it, or you fulfill, 
I guess yes, you got a car loan. You signed to pay the debt. When you're done, the debt's over. You don't keep paying it. It's been fulfilled. So that's what this gospel is trying to show, how Yahshua, Yash, Yahweh through Yahshua, paid for us. And we're going to stop do, trying to do it ourselves. All right, that's it. Thank you very much. Uh, I hope you got something. I, I thank you for this opportunity. And thank you, Yahshua, for doing this for us. Yes. All right, that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Domitz. Our next speaker for to this today will be Dr. Andy Craig. Well, I hope you were all listening to the first speaker and he was delivering a, a message straight from the heart. Now, one of the things he was talking about was this tabernacle pattern. And we want to know that this tabernacle pattern is, is in your Bible. And it's been there all the time. And we always just... You know, if you ever read the Bible before, mostly you just read right over that. Mm -hmm. It's like that was what they did back there in the wilderness of Sinai. How does that, it doesn't apply to me, right? Well, yes it does, it applies to you greatly. And uh, if you look up the word tabernacle in the dictionary, please. And he, he kind of touched on how this tabernacle pattern, that we have to, um, and go back and get Genesis where Yahweh Elohim says, let us make man in our image after our likeness. Oh, Okay. Okay. Tabernacle out of the American Heritage Dictionary. No, we're just looking up the word tabernacle. Because it's important to understand that this tabernacle is not only a structure, but it also has a function. Okay? And we want to look at the structure of it. That's what you'll see depicted on these charts. And by the way, this is a chart that came from the vision that Yahweh Elohim gave to Dr. Henry Clifford Kinley in the year in 1931. All right, uh, go ahead, tabernacle. Tabernacle, definition number one, the portable sanctuary in which the Jews carried the Ark of the Covenant through the desert. So it's a portable sanctuary that the Jews had that they had the Ark of the Covenant when they were back here in the wilderness of Sinai. Go ahead. Two or B, it says the Jewish temple. Two, it says a, uh, let's see, a case or box on a church altar containing the consecrated host and wine of the Eucharist. Okay, well that's in the Roman Catholic Church, right? That's what they have, it's a tabernacle where they keep the Eucharist and the wine. Now, uh, go back to Genesis, Genesis, where Yahweh Elohim said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. Genesis 1, okay, Genesis 1 and 26. Mm -hmm. Okay, go ahead. Genesis 1 and 26. No, Genesis 1 and 26. Let us look at this for just a moment. Where Genesis come from, the book of Genesis? That came from Moses' vision. Now, did you know that before you sat in this, came into this class down here? Did anybody realize that you know, we thought that the book of Genesis was written by a scribe, and then, then 
uh, the first chapter was written by some people and the second chapter was written by other people because it just doesn't seem to fit together any other way. But that's not, the, that's not reality at all, folks. All right, go ahead, start over. And Elohim said, let us make man in our image. Now, El this is what Elohim said. Let us, who's he talking to, by the way? Ever think of that? Yeah. When he says, let us, is, is somebody up there helping him? Has he got, has he got, no, he's got a right-hand man doing all the work while he just, no, that's not what it is. See, Elohim is a, a plural form of the word Eloah. He doesn't need a helper. He's complete within himself, and he can do it all by himself. So he's saying here, this is in Genesis, which is a product of Moses' vision that he had in the second principal trip into Mount Sinai back here. Let us make man in our image. Right? Yep. So he's made all the beasts of the field back here. Then he's going to make this man. He's going to make this man in his image. Read on. After our likeness. After his likeness. Well, what is his likeness? His likeness is he's an Elohim. He's an archetype or original pattern of the universe. He's a heavenly anthropomorphic being. I know that's a big word. Break it down. What does it mean? Heavenly man-like figure being. Okay? Heavenly anthropomorphic. So what is it? Let us make man in our image after our likeness. Go ahead. And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea. Now, why does the man get to have dominion over the fish of the sea and the fowl in the air and every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth? Because he's made in the image of Yahweh Elohim. Because that's what Yahweh Elohim has. He's the one that's got the whole control over the whole show, folks. He's the king of the castle. Nobody else. He's in charge. This is, this is something we didn't realize before we came into this class. That he... And he's not, he's not in charge of some things. He's in charge of everything. Even the mystery of iniquity. He's not out of control. Go ahead. And so Elohim created man in his own image. So Elohim created man in his own image. Go ahead. In the image of Elohim created he him. Now, so he created him and then he came down in a physical body back here. Now let's look at something for a second. Let's look at the operation of Yahshua the Messiah by the pattern of the tabernacle. How's that? All right. Now, where, where, where did he begin? He began where? He began in heaven. Now, let's go over and get some scriptures here. Um, Exodus 25 and 22. And we're going to look at Yahshua's mission according to the tabernacle pattern. All right? Because he didn't start down here. He started where? He came down from heaven, folks, which means he started up here in the most holy place, which is a type and shadow of heaven itself, which is a type and shadow of Canaan land, which is the type and shadow of the most holy place in the greater and more perfect tabernacle, which is the operation through the uh, children of Israel's uh, migration from Egypt through the wilderness of Sinai into Canaan land. All right. So where did Yahshua start out? He came down from heaven. You got that, Exodus? Exodus 25 and 22. Uh-huh. And there I will meet with thee. Where is he talking, there I will meet with you? In the He's talking about the high priest who goes into this tabernacle pattern of the Day of Atonement back here. He says, See, there he's going to meet with him. Where? Go on. Oh. And I will commune with thee from above the mercy seat. I will commune with thee from above the mercy seat. So where is he starting out, folks? He's starting out. He's king. He's in heaven, folks. He's going to come down from heaven. Go ahead and read. From between the two cherubims. Between the two cherubims. You know what? That's where he was sitting when he saw Lucifer getting cast out of, out of heaven. Mm -hmm. Because he says he saw Lucifer as lightning do what? He went right on by. He fell from up here. Yahshua sitting here. He went, Phew. Satan went right on by. He saw him fall from heaven at like lightning. Go ahead. Of all things which I will give thee in commandment unto the children of Israel. So he, the point of that was that he will... Uh, 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 he, you want me to read it? Go back. Right. Up. No, get Leviticus 16 and 2. Okay. I can't remember them, so I have them all written down. Mm -hmm. Leviticus 16 and 2. And Yahweh said unto Moses, Speak unto Aaron thy brother, 
That now, Yahweh is saying unto Moses, this is in the structure. Remember, we're looking at structure and function and operation. We're looking at Yahshua's operation in his ministry by the pattern of the tabernacle. All right. So he came down from heaven. Go ahead and start that over. And Yahweh said unto Moses. Now, Yahweh said unto Moses. Go on. Speak unto Aaron, thy brother. Now, he's going to speak unto Aaron, his brother. Why is he going to speak unto Aaron, his brother? Because Aaron's going to be the high priest in the tabernacle. All right. So he's got to speak to Aaron, his brother. Aaron needs some instruction. Has Aaron been a high priest before in his life that he has experienced to do this? <laughs> I don't think so. He needs to be taught what to do. He needs to follow this as a, as, as a rule every, all the way on down. All right, speak unto Aaron thy brother. Read on. That he come not at all times into the holy place. That he come not at all times into the holy place. Now, when we read the Bible, there's, there's sometimes one word is used in a different situation than another word. Like, uh, You'll find where this is called the tabernacle. You'll also find where just the most holy place and the holy place is called the tabernacle. You'll also find where Joshua's tent that's on the back side of the mount is called the what? The tabernacle of the people. So see how the one word operates in three different ways sometimes. You have to understand what he's trying to communicate to get exactly what he's looking at. Now, start ahead and start that over again. 16 and 2 of Leviticus. Uh -huh. And Yahweh said unto Moses, Speak unto Aaron thy brother, that he come not at all times into the holy place. So this is the holy place. This is the most holy place. He's not supposed to come at all times in there. Why? Because that's Yahweh's throne room up there, folks. He's sitting up there, and you're not supposed to do that to his place. Right? Now, the other thing about that is, is it's dark in there. There's no light in there. The other thing you have to realize is the way this tabernacle was constructed, this is a 15 by 15 by 15 foot cube. Because the boards are 15 feet tall. It's 15 feet from the second veil to the back side of the most holy place up there. So it's 15 by 15 by 15. And we could get into the dimensions that are, are shown by the scale drawing of the tabernacle pattern to show you that this is, there's, this is absolutely divinely inspired. This is not the, 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 the product of mankind's heart and mind. Go ahead and read. Mm -hmm. Aaron, thy brother, that he come not at all times into the holy place within the veil, before the mercy seat, right. which is upon the ark, that he die not, for I will appear in the cloud upon the mercy so seat. So he's going to appear in a cloud upon the mercy seat. That's his throne room, folks. Go ahead. Any more there? No. Um, John 3.13 and 6.38. John 3 and 13. John 3 and 13. And no man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven. Hold it. Who's talking here? Yashua. Yashua. Yashua's talking here, right? No man has ascended up into heaven, which remember what we're talking about, the most holy place is a type and shadow of heaven. No man has ascended up to heaven, except who? He that came down from heaven. Well, who's that? That's Yahweh Elohim. That's Yahshua that came down from heaven. So he's starting out on his, his, his operation. He's starting out from the most holy place because that's where he had to come down from. He's come down from heaven. And he came down to where, folks? Especially prepared body, the last speaker was talking about. He came down into where? Into the earth plane. That's where he did. He came down here to do what the, 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 the mission that he was supposed to do, which was to do what? Fulfill that, that first figure went into that. We're going to, going to fulfill these old carnal ordinances and take them out of the way, nail them to the cross, and, and come into a spiritual age down here today where we can have the spirit of Yahshua the Messiah in us. Now, so Yahshua starts his mission where he starts in heaven. Then what's he going to do? He's going to come right on down to the earth. You got to go, um, wait, John 6 38. John 6 and 38. For I came down from heaven. Not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. Now, he came down from heaven not to do his own will, but the will of him that sent him. So there he does. He comes all the way down into the earth lane, right? Which is outside the gate, which is out, it, outside the tabernacle. That he's, it, the, and he's into the greater, what, we, what is known as the greater and more perfect 
tabernacle, which is what? The whole creation is the greater and more perfect tabernacle. See, that's another phrase that's used in another way, too. All right, the, the greater and more perfect tabernacle, because sometimes we're ref we use it to refer to the, the uh, uh, children of Israel coming out of Egypt in the wilderness of Sinai into Canaan's land, right? But you can also, it's Yahweh, exi Elohim exists in the greater, more perfect tabernacle, which is the whole universe, all right? So here he is, Yahshua's coming down, and where he comes to first, what we want to see is there are seven steps in this tabernacle pattern. All right? The first step is the what? The gate. the gate. The second step is the altar of sin sacrifice. The third step is the laver. The fourth step is the door. The fifth step is the holy place. Sixth step is the second veil, which divides between the holy place and the most holy place. And the seventh step is the most holy place, where the throne of Yahweh exists between the wings of the cherubim on the Ark of the Covenant. All right, so he's coming down from the seventh step all the way down whew, outside the gate. All right, uh, Exodus 27, 13 through 17. Now, Yahshua came down from heaven. 13 through 17, I think. Yeah, well, let's, let's, actually, let's, let, let's skip that one, go right to the gate. Numbers 4 and 3. Because we want, we want to understand that the dimensions of this tabernacle are important too. Now, how wide is the gate, folks? Now, why is it 30 feet wide? What age did the high priest have to be before he could minister in the tabernacle pattern? 30 years old. How old was Joshua the Messiah when he started, came unto John the Baptist to be baptized and start his ministry in the earth plane? 30 years old. That's just, just, what? That's just coincidence, isn't it? Yeah, it is. It is a coincident. Go ahead, Numbers. Numbers 4 and 30. From 30 years old and upward, even unto 50 years old, shalt thou number them. Every one that entereth into the service to do the work of the tabernacle of the congregation. Okay, so it's got to be 30 years old. Up to Yeah, it was Numbers 4 and 30 is what I read. I read Numbers 4 and 30. Yeah, 4 and 3 is what I got in here. Yeah, from 30 years old. Oh, they're both exactly the same then. They're exactly the same. Do you want me to read 3 Well, that's very interesting. Yeah, but it says the same thing in 3. I thought you said 30. But it says, Numbers 4 and 3 says, from 30 years old and upward even until 50 years all that enter into the host to do the work in the tabernacle of the So three and thirty both say the same thing? Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's two witnesses in one place. Oh, we're complaining the coincidence again. All right. I like it. That's good. That's good. Um, uh, Luke 3 and 23. And then Matthew 7, 13 through 14. See, we're following Yahshua's steps right from being up here in the most holy place, coming on out. Now he's going to make his way by operation right up through the tabernacle pattern. Go ahead. Luke 3 and 23. And Yahshua himself began to be about 30 years of age. There you go. Mm -hmm. 30 years of age. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. um, as, was ex as was supposed, the son of Joseph which was the son of Heli. Yeah, he was supposed to be the son of Joseph. You know he wasn't the son of Joseph, right? right. Go ahead. Any more? Um, which was the son of, it says, Methat. Do you want to keep going with the genealogy? Matthew seven thirteen through 14. Okay. Matthew 7 and 13. Enter ye in at the straight gate. Now, what are we talking about entering into here? Tabernacle. We're entering into the tabernacle. Where are you going to enter the tabernacle? Is there a back door? No. Can you climb the fence? Can't do that either, can you? Because this holy place and most holy place is surrounded by 15 foot tall gold covered boards. You're not going to climb up over those 15 foot boards either, are you? So you've got to enter in where? There's only one way in, folks. 
That's through the gate right here. Enter in through the straight gate. Read on. Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate. Now wait. Wide is the gate. This 30 feet wide, right? Go ahead. And broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. Now what's the first thing you come to when you walk through the gate? Praise an altar of sin, sacrifice with a fire that Yahweh lit, and it's, it's burning in there, right? So what you're going to do, you're going to come to uh, what? Broad is the way and leads to destruction, right? Mm -hmm. Look at here. What, with the type of shadow of this gate down here is what's going to happen down here in the eschatology, folks, where the earth and the water and the earth is burned up, all right? So that's where you, the first step you come to this altar of sin sacrifice. Go ahead and read. And broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way, which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. Okay, that enters into life, and there's few there be that find it. So Yahshua's come down from heaven, and he's going out from outside the gate at 30 years old into the...